Let the church be the church united in prayer. My brothers and sisters, if Christian unity provides effective movement for the church and Christian love provides heartbeat to the church then Christians united in prayer is the conduit for power of the church uh, a prayerless church is a powerless church. No prayer. You're going to help me preach. No power. But a church that knows prayer is a church that knows power. One of the most prolific Christian authors on this matter of prayer, E. M. Bound says this, that when in the duty of prayer the church fails, that's when the world prevails. That when in the duty of prayer God's people fail, that's when the world prevails. My brothers and sisters, we need to recognize this morning that the devil really doesn't mind us shouting. As long as you don't pray. Because he knows that if he can present you uh, with the right set of circumstances without prayer, your shout will cease. Satan, my brothers and sisters, really doesn't mind us serving the Lord. Just don't pray to the Lord. Because he understands that without prayer undergirding your ministry, that all someone has to do is criticize you. All someone has to do is say something negative about you in your service and you will go and sit down in a pew and join the ranks of the Lord's frozen chosen. Satan doesn't mind if you serve. Just don't undergird it with prayer. Satan really doesn't mind if you attend worship on a regular basis, if you come to church regularly, just don't pray regularly. That way, uh, when the preacher says something that makes you mad, uh, you, you start being absent from the service because you haven't prayed. Uh, when someone doesn't speak to you, uh, you stop speaking to them because uh, your Christian walk is not undergirded with prayer. The church does something to upset you as one of its members, and you stop giving your tithe, your offering, because you have not undergirded your walk in Christ with prayer. You can come to church every Sunday. Just don't learn to pray. And Satan doesn't mind it at all. Because the Bible teaches, brothers and sisters, that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. That's why the Bible teaches that men, women, the church ought to always pray and faint not because there is power in prayer. The 
first century church, uh, they were ardent believers in the power of prayer. In this passage, in this pericope, if you will, uh, you will see that the church is under intense persecution for proclaiming and teaching in the name of Jesus. That uh, the Sanhedrin Council and all of those religious leaders in Jerusalem, they thought that they had gotten rid of Jesus. That they thought that they had stamped out the faith and that they would never have to hear the name of Jesus again. But uh, unbeknownst to them, he appeared unto his disciples and Peter too. He, he was risen from the grave uh, and thus uh, on their way to the temple, uh, Peter and John saw an ugly sight at a beautiful and uh, the man asked them for alms, and they stood up to him and said, A silver and gold we don't have, uh, but in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And Peter, taking him by the hand, helped him up, and he went leaping and praising God into the temple with Peter and John. And so there, Peter, John, and the once lame man, he's no, more long, he's no longer lame, he's now leaping. They are there at the eastern station at Solomon's porch, there at the temple in Jerusalem, preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. And while Peter and John were teaching and preaching, the once lame man stood beside them leaping. And, and so the religious leaders caught wind of this and they went over to the east side of the temple, to Solomon's porch, to go and confront Peter and John. What in the world are you doing still proclaiming the name of Jesus? And the Bible says that they seized Peter and John and they locked them away because it was evening. But early the next day, they uh, clamored together and they put Peter and John before them and said, Now explain yourself. Why are you still teaching and preaching in a dead man's and, and, and Peter stood up in their presence and gave them a three-point sermon. Yeah. And he entitled that sermon, There's Something About the Name Jesus. And, and he had three points to that sermon. Yeah. He, he said, first, you need to understand uh, that there's power in the name of Jesus. And it's in his name that you see this man who was once lame now standing beside us, leaping and shouting and giving glory to God. That was Peter's first point, that there's power in the name of Jesus. Peter's second point is that, uh, P that Jesus' name is indestructible. Yeah. He talked about the indestructibility of Jesus' name because he told them that this same Jesus, he is the stone that the builders rejected, uh, but this same Jesus that God raised up from the dead, he has now become the chief cornerstone. You thought you got rid of him. You thought that you destroyed him, but Jesus' name is indestructible. There's something about the name Jesus. And then his third point. He says there's salvation in the name Jesus because there's no other name given under heaven or earth whereby men must be saved except the name Jesus. That was Peter's sermon. Something about the name Jesus. And, and so they 
sent Peter and John aside and they conferred amongst them said, themselves and said that we cannot deny that this man was once lame and now he's leaping. We can't deny the miracle, but what we will do then is deny them the opportunity to continue to preach and teach in Jesus' name. All right, all right. And so they go back to Peter and John. And they say, we don't want you speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus anymore. And they said, uh, whether it's right for us to do what you have charged us to do or what God has charged us to do, you be the judge of that. But we cannot help but speak and to teach what we have seen and heard. And on a side note, just let me put this out before you. God needs some more we just cannot help Christians. When you're on your job, I just cannot help but talk about Jesus. When I'm in the airport, I just cannot help but talk about the Lord. When I'm in the grocery store, I just cannot help because he's done so much he's done so much for me just throw that in parenthetically he, 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 and, and, and so uh, they let them go after threatening them further and Peter and John run back to their company to their fellow believers and the Bible says that they begin to explain to them everything that transpired uh, when they were in custody. They told them about all of the threatenings that were transpiring now against the church, against the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I believe, brothers and sisters, as we examine and look at this text, we will be able to glean some principles that we too can apply in the midst of life's pressures and vicissitudes, in the midst of the persecution that is now coming against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because just like they wanted Peter and John to shut up and be quiet talking about Jesus, society today wants the church to shut up and stop talking about Jesus in public places. You can talk about him all you want to in the church house. Just don't bring the name of Jesus out into the public square. You can talk about politics, you can talk about sports, you can talk about finances, uh, you can talk about tolerance, you can talk about diversity inclusion, you can talk about uh, alternate lifestyles, just don't talk about Jesus. Leave him in the church house. And, and so there is a swell of persecution I don't know if you see it, but there's a swell of persecution, brothers and sisters, that is mounting against the body of Christ. And just like this first century church, we must learn some important principles as it pertains to prayer. Let me give you those and then we'll be on our way shortly. First, when you examine the church, the text, we can see that when faced with a problem, the priority of prayer should permeate the people. When faced with a problem, the priority of prayer ought, should permeate God's people. Notice that when the company heard all that Peter and John explained to them and told them about the persecution that was now bearing down on the church, notice that their first response was to pray. They lifted their voices together unto the Lord and they prayed. No one had a dissenting opinion. No one was murmuring and complaining. 
No one said that we need to call together a meeting so that we can then discuss and decide what we are to do next. The church had already received its directive from the Lord that you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. They had already received their directive. Now they just needed boldness in the face of adversity. And so they prayed. But notice what the scripture says. It says that they prayed with one accord. They prayed, brothers and sisters, with one accord. And that phrase, one accord, it means that they prayed with one mind and one heart and one passion. And it's very interesting when you study that phrase in the Greek language, it really has a hint of musicality to it. Because the idea of that phrase is just like in an orchestra. You have different sections who are uh, playing different notes. But because they're all looking at the same sheet music, and because their eyes are all fixed on the same conductor, even though over in this section the horns are playing one note and in this section the strings are playing a different note and in this section the percussions are playing another note because they're looking at the same sheet music and their eyes are focused on the same conductor everybody playing at the same time it just sounds like melodic harmony the Bible is teaching us is that when the church comes together on one accord and you lift up your voice and you lift up your voice and you lift up your voice because we serve the good shepherd he knows each of our voices individually but when we pray unto the Lord on one accord it comes up before the ears of God as a symphony before our God God loves when his people gather together in accord and pray because we're looking at the same sheet music. I'm looking at the same Bible you're looking at. I'm reading the same text you're reading. We have our eyes on the same conductor. And when we come together in prayer, there's nothing that God cannot do. We have to understand, brothers and sisters, that prayer and the priority of prayer ought to permeate God's people. Let me, let me give you something here. Prayer, when it's the church's priority, it places our problem. When, when prayer becomes a priority in the life of the believer, it, faces, it places your problem in the proper hands. You see, brothers and sisters, if you give me a basketball now, at the age I'm at now, now Merva can tell you what I could do when I was in my 20s, but if you give me a basketball now, I might be able to get you five. I, I might be able to get you ten points before I have to raise my hand and, and, and ask the coach to pull me out the game. If you put a, a golf club in my hand on a good day, I, I can give you maybe an 82 or 85. But on a bad day, I give you 188, 195. That's with a golf club in my hand. But, but when you uh, put uh, the instrument in the right hand, when you, when you put a basketball in Steph Curry's hand, he, he'll drop 50 on you without even blinking an eye. 
if, if you put a golf club in Tiger Woods' hand, he, he'll give you 106 professional golf championships and 14 major championships. When you put your problems in your own hand, you're not going to get anything back but a mess and failure and disappointment. But you place your problems in the master's hand and, and you'll get a strong tower, You'll get a mighty defense. You'll get a way maker. You'll get a heart fixer. You'll get a mind regulator. You'll get a bridge over troubled water. You'll get a lily in the valley. You'll get alpha, omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last. Put your problems in the right hand. Give your burdens over to the Lord and leave them there. Because he can handle them. So the church must learn to place preeminence, priority on prayer. But, but not only must there be a priority on prayer, there should also be proper perspective in prayer. Proper perspective in prayer. Notice that as they prayed, that uh, they, they, they said this, Lord, you are God. You've made the heavens and the sea and the earth and everything in it. They prayed, brothers and sisters, with a proper perspective. They prayed with a deep understanding and appreciation of who God is and what he is capable of. They prayed, brothers and sisters, understanding that God alone is the one and only true and living God. And that God alone is creator and sustainer and maker of all that is. And so what they understood, because they had a proper perspective in prayer, is that if God creates a mountain, he's able to take me up the mountain. If God carved out a valley, he's able to carry me through that same valley. If God made the seas, even though my enemy is pursuing me, all I have to do is call on his name and he will part the waters so that I can walk through on dry ground. They had a proper perspective in prayer. Now, I have at home a, a dish satellite system. And every now and then, it gives me a distorted picture. It, it, when the winds blow real strong, the picture will tend to get distorted. When the rains really pour down. I'm not, I'm not just talking about a sprinkle, but I'm talking about when it really comes down. Uh, my, my, my television system, it, it, it seems to go on and off because there is some atmospheric interference uh, between the satellite in the sky and the dish on my roof. And, and I call the manufacturer. I got them on the phone and, and they told me, uh, Mr. McDonald, you, you don't have to worry about it uh, because on the box there in front of your television, uh, th there's a reset button. And then now you may have to bend down to reach it. You may have to stoop over to find it, but, but all you have to do is just press the reset button. 
and all of that atmospheric interference that's keeping you from seeing a clear picture, once you press the reset button, uh, the, the picture will become clear once again. You need to understand, my brothers and sisters, that prayer is the Christian's reset button. You may have to go down on your knees to reach it. You might have to bend over to reach it. But I dare you in prayer to push the reset button. It will change the atmospheric pressure in your situation so that you can see God with a clear picture. So that you understand that no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. You'll get a clear picture and see that weeping may endure for a night but joy is going to come in the morning. You'll get a clear picture and see that we are more than conquerors through Christ who gives us strength. You'll get a clear picture. You'll get a clear picture and know that there's no other power on earth that can do what God can do. You have to learn to pray the proper perspective. The church has to learn to put a priority on prayer. But third and lastly, we have to appreciate that God's providence persistently prevails against our problems. God's providence persistently prevails against our problems. When, when you look at the text, you'll see that uh, Peter and John, they begin to recite an Old Testament song. They talk about how uh, the heathen raged and how the king stood up. And then they transitioned that text over into their contemporary time and, and reminded us how uh, Pontius Pilate and, and Herod uh, and, and all of those religious leaders, how they conspired and came against Jesus and ultimately crucified him. But, but I want you to notice and understand that, that he says something in that text. He, he says everything that they did uh, was couched between two great parentheses. That, that everything they did was couched between the hand of God and God's counsel. On one side was God's hand holding them back so that they could not do more than he had preordained. On the other hand was God's wisdom so that everything that they did actually worked for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to their purpose. I just want you to understand this morning uh, that there are divine parameters around your life. And though Satan comes against you, he will ultimately be destroyed. He will not be victorious because the Bible has already declared that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're in the body of Christ, Satan is going to come after you. He's going to give you his best shot. But you're already an overcomer. You're already a victory in Christ Jesus. A victory. Victory is ours in Jesus Christ. What, 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 what we have to understand, my brothers and sisters, is ultimately the fight, the, the fight is fixed. <laughs> that, that, that's what God wants you to understand. That, that battle you're going through right now, the, the, the fight is fixed. The situation that has you turbulent right now the fight is fixed whatever is going on in your life you need to understand the fight is fixed because it all occurs within God's divine parameters now when when, when I thought about that the Lord he took me back to my childhood and as a boy Cousin, a narrow. We used to.
used to love to watch uh, worldwide wrestling. Uh, we, we, we used to love watching the Von Erichs fight. Kerry Von Erich, Kevin Von Erich, Vince Von Erich. And, and, and they would fight against uh, the likes of Kabuki and Andre the Giant and Iceman King Parson and, and, and King Kong Bundy. And every now and then they would go up against Bruiser Brody. And, 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 and they would be getting their butts whipped by Iceman Parson and Bruiser Brody. But, but they never lost the fight. It was rare that Kerry Von Erich or Fritz Von Erich or Kevin Von Erich lost the fight. And I started scratching my head about that. Why would they never lose a fight? And then when I researched it, I come to find out that Fitz Von Erich owned Worldwide Wrestling. <laughs> Fitz Von Erich owned Worldwide Wrestling. And so he, he so constructed the bouts that either he or his son, uh, they might get knocked down in the first round. Uh, they might get punched in the second round. They might get tripped up in the third round. The opponent might have them pinned down and get a count of two. But every time uh, they would kick and the opponent would fall off of them. And, and, and every now and then, Carrie and Kevin seemed like they were going to lose the fight. Uh, but Fitz, who represents the father, uh, he, he, he comes out of nowhere. And he did what he called the iron claw. And he would put that iron claw on your head until your enemy passed out. And then your father would step aside and he would allow you to jump on your opponent and the referee would give him a three count and you got the victory, but Fitz got the glory. All you gotta do is lift that a little higher. I don't care what you're fighting against. The fight is fixed. And when the devil thinks he has you, you got a heavenly father. He'll come from nowhere. He has an iron claw. He'll put that claw on your enemy and he'll knock him out. He'll allow you to jump on the enemy so you get the victory but guess who gets the glory God you ought to give him praise you ought to give him honor you ought to give him glory can anybody say thank you because the fight is fixed thank you I know the fight is fixed Satan you got me down right now but the fight is fixed I don't know how the ends are going to meet but the fight is fixed I don't know what they're going to do on the job but the fight is fixed I don't know what's happening in Washington but the fight the fight is fixed the fight, the fight, the fight is fixed. The fight is fixed, I tell you. When we pray, when we pray, brothers and sisters, when we pray, you need to understand that God, he will move. When we pray, God will show up. When we pray, God will fight our battle. When we pray, God is going to shake things up in your life. L -l Let me bring some witnesses. Abraham prayed, and God gave him a son through a once barren womb. Israel prayed, and God delivered them out of Egyptian bondage. Moses prayed, and God rained down manna from the sky. David prayed, and God delivered the Philistine army into his hand. Elijah prayed, and God rained down fire from heaven that consumed the altar. Jeremiah prayed, and he discovered that there really is a balm in Gilead. Jonah prayed. And God saved him out of the belly of a whale. Ezekiel prayed. And dry bones that were brittle and dead jumped up and danced around. 
Daniel prayed and the lion slept and Daniel was kept. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prayed. And Jesus became the fourth man in their fiery furnace. But they weren't the only ones that prayed. Jesus prayed. And he turned a funeral procession into a family reunion. Jesus prayed. And he took two fish and five loaves and fed 5,000. Jesus prayed. And he walked on the storm that was trying to walk over his people. Jesus prayed and he surrendered his will to his father's will. Jesus prayed and he gave eternal paradise to a thief. Jesus prayed and he gave forgiveness to his enemies. Jesus prayed and he commended his spirit into his father's hands. Jesus prayed and he gave salvation to a dying world. Jesus prayed and he gave glory and victory to you and me. He died. But early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands. And even right now, he sits at the right hand of the Father and he's waiting for you to pray. He's your eternal high priest. Somebody in here ought to know what the old folk say. It's not my mother. It's not my father. But it's me, oh Lord. I'm the one standing in the need of prayer. And not my sister. And not my brother. But it's me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. Not the preacher. Not the deacon. But it's me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. And somebody in here ought to know that God will answer your prayer. Have you ever had to call on him? Didn't he come through? Didn't he come see about you? Didn't he shake your situation up? Didn't he plant your feet on solid ground? Didn't he turn things around? Just pray, call on his name. All you got to do is place priority on prayer. Maintain a proper perspective in prayer and understand that God's providence prevails against all odds.